Okay, uh, well, uh, Professor Mark Horwitz of Stanford has been uh, working in this area, particularly in the communications part, uh, for a very, very long time. And uh, so his title is uh, Power Scaling and the Future of CMOS. Thank you very much. What that means is I, I'm older than I look, I guess. Um, so I'm going to give you a little overview of my view of both the future of CMOS and how power affects things. Um, I'm going to come at this a slightly different view, uh, maybe similar to some of the things that Bill talked about, but slightly less galactic because I'm a less galactic guy. Um, I just was scribbling on the slide a little bit because we've been hearing about all these future things and the limits of CMOS and stuff like that. So I just want to put things in perspective a little bit. Um, Il Adelon uh, and I were trying to figure out, I've had some students who look at sort of the energy efficiency of things. And so I think in a 20 nanometer technology, if you're running at about half a volt, okay, which is on the low side, but you know, you're operating at a frequency maybe 10x slower than what you could operate if you operated at normal voltages. Um, an ad will consume about 20 femtojoules of power, and I think a floating point operation, maybe a floating point multiply ad, 32-bit, not double precision, is about a picojoule. Okay. So just to keep that in perspective, power is a huge problem because we're incredibly greedy. I mean, we have loads that are very high. I, I will let you figure out how many ads you can do per second for a watt. But it's a big number. And floating point operations, what this says is you can do a gigaflat for a milliwatt. Okay. So what that says is that any of the new technologies that are going to come out that are going to supplant CMOS have to do better than that, which is sort of... Um, maybe giving away my punchline, which is I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> Anyhow, um, as people said a long time ago in a building not that far away from Berkeley, a little closer to Stanford, um, a man made a prediction that has really defined an industry. Of course, I'm talking about Gordon Moore. This is the actual copy of the original plot. I love showing my students this because Back in the 60s, they didn't even draw a straight line. They felt compelled to put the line through every point. You know, I, I honor that, 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 that rigor. We don't do that anymore. We just draw the straight line through. We ignore the outlier. Um, but you know, for a long time, processors were sort of the poster child for Moore's Law. Forget that Moore's Law was really about um, density of transistors, had nothing to do with performance. Somehow it got morphed into computer performance double in double every 18 months or so. And you know, this is a plot of all CMOS microprocessors. CMOS microprocessors started about 86-ish. You know, and we're on this great tear. But you know, I've strategically placed the legend of this chart over the recent years. If you move the chart over, you realize the world has changed a little bit. So that the performance scaling of uniprocessors, at least, has really died off. Um, and the reason this occurred um, is because of one of the two problems that Gordon talked about. And it is true that, it, you know, Gordon Moore's paper is up on the web. It's three pages, four pages maybe. It's not very long. It's really interesting to go read it because, you know, what he talks about as being the big problems that the industry faces is design cost. Well, that's one of the huge problems we're facing today. Power dissipation, well, that is the other huge problem we're facing today. And what to do with the functionality? Well, we've, that's not such a problem. Okay. But the point is that it is design cost and power dissipation that are basically driving us into a corner these days. Um, and I'll talk more about that as I move on. So what saved us over a long period of time is what I call, and I think many other people call ideal scaling or Denard scaling, where what you do is when you scale the feature sizes, you reduce voltages. And Bob Denard, 30-some-odd um, years ago, basically wrote this up. And said the power density, if you do this, remains constant, which should say, as we scale the mic microprocessors, the power of the microprocessor should remain constant. But if you look at it over time, this is the power of the microprocessors, and that doesn't look constant to me, especially because it's a semi-log scale. Now, you will notice that right when the performance of the processors bent over, the power also maxed out, indicating maybe the problem with increasing performance had to do with something with power limits. So what went wrong? 
The first thing you could say, well, during this period of time, chips got bigger. So it must have been the fact that the chips got bigger was the reason power increased. Unfortunately, if you plot watts per square millimeter, um, it doesn't take much off the exponential. So power density has really been increasing. So what caused the increase? Well, the answer is pretty simple. We were either smart or greedy, and I'll let you decide which. If you looked at the technology scaling line, which is what Bob Denard said we should do, you get a line that would have clock frequency running along the black thing. But in fact, what really happened is that sometime in the early 90s, we went on this sort of tear, and we started increasing clock frequency exponentially faster than the technology. Right, semi-log plots, right? Okay, now if you think about it, if clock frequency was scaling at the right rate, power would be constant. If clock frequency is scaling faster, power should go up, and it's indeed what happened. Um, and what's nice to know is that the power, the people who pushed the clock early were also the people who had high power. So the way we did that is we basically used um, shorter pipelines, more pipeline stages, better circuit design to make things go faster, but all those things in turn increased power density. Well, the good news is that for the people who were really the avant-garde here, the DEC Alpha guys, they were not only avant-garde in hitting 200 megahertz in the early 90s, but they also hit 20 watts in the early 90s. So it is very much correlated with the short tick machine that had the higher power or power densities. And the good news is, on the previous slide, we haven't, we haven't really improved from an architectural or circuit perspective from this point since the early 90s. So you would think maybe this excess power scaling is going to go away. So the good news is that they has gone away, that we're no longer increasing clock frequency super to the technology. In fact, we're increasing it more slowly to the technology. But as many people alluded to this morning, we hit a bigger problem, which power supply voltages, which are supposed to scale down, have stopped scaling. This is data from Ed Noick at IBM, just plotting out both the oxide thickness, which is kind of leveled out a little bit, VDD, which is leveled out as we're scaling, and threshold voltages, which are stopped scaling. And the reason we can't scale thresholds, as has been alluded to earlier, is because if we do, leakage current increases too much. So what does that mean? Technology scaling today, devices are still scaling down. And what's driving this is it's cheaper to build the chip in the new technology, because it's smaller square microns, same functionality, I can sell you it to you at the same price, but it costs me less to make in the fab because it's less square microns. Um, and this is what's driving scaling. Voltages are not scaling very fast. Threshold voltages are set by leakage concerns. Um, gate oxide thicknesses are set by leakage concerns. The reason high K was such a big deal that was talked about this morning. Um, but it means channel lengths are not scaling that much. And Kern is basically being increased by magic. So I appreciate Chen Min and other people in the world who can do this magic and somehow get the mo effective mobility better. But you know, every time they do it, it's a new magical step. right? And if they use some indium or whatever, I don't care. That's, I, thank you very much. But it's not like the old times where I could just count on things being there. right? Um, and in particular, the VDD and VTH are now set by optimization. Um, so if silicon scaling is slowing down, what about other technologies? Right? And we've heard a bunch about them in the morning. Okay, personally, I'm not optimistic. Um, the current problems we're trying to address are uh, limits of voltage scaling are set by KT on Q. And I'm a guy who likes to build systems that have millions of gates and have all of them work. So my number of KTs that I require are a little bit bigger than other people. Um, uh, and wire energy is set by CV squared. And any device that's going to communicate signals robustly, um, either going to use electron on wires, which are going to have to dissipate the same energy, or going to have to do something magical. Right? And I'm all for an auto transformer that can take a one volt swing at the device and convert it into a 100 millivolt swing at the wire. I'm all for that. If anybody knows where one of those are, let me know. But I'm not going to bet my company or life or even my research on it. Um, so I think to get around these limitations, we're going to have to create something that's really very different. And what I've learned by basically working in technology and trying to do things only just a little different is that Design processes have really been 
built for a particular thing. And unfortunately, if you do something really new and interesting, it's like boiling the ocean problem. If you build it, they don't come, right? You have to have some way inserting your technology into an existing market and make money, because the venture business is only willing to put a certain amount of money into you. And if you have to redesign and recreate the entire silicon design architecture from logic all the way down to make use of this new quantum technology, I don't think it's going to happen. So the question is, we think about design of computing things in terms of binary signals. Why binary? Well, it's because that's what works from a noise margin perspective in silicon. Why do we have separated logic and memory? Why do we think about computing going to register files and memories? It's because memories were different technologies historically, and they still are, essentially. There's no fundamental reason to do that. And if you look at a lot of the new, weirder technologies, they don't have that problem. Great, but how the heck are you going to design them? Right? Until you can answer that question, I don't think there's going to be a big uptake. And finally, the problem is that, as I pointed out on the first slide, for almost no money, I can give you almost infinite computing for almost no power. So if you're going to introduce something into today's market, you're going to have to do better than me. You know, we can complain about Flash being a terrible technology and being way too expensive, but the fact is they ship you today about a gigabyte of memory for almost no dollars. I don't remember what it is. It's a couple bucks today, I think, right? And they do that in high volume. So to replace it, you're going to have to be able to build some cool technology that can ship billions of bits, not globally on each device you ship. And that's just an enormous engineering channel, challenge. So I, I, I mean, people talking about new technology always like to talk about new technology, but in reality, it's the modifications of old technology that generally win. And what happens is new technologies win in completely new and different areas. Right? So for computing, I'm betting on silicon. OK, the problem is silicon's not going to disappear, I believe. It's still going to be a huge business. Its growth rate will be slower. It's not going to scale as fast. And it's not going to change as much as it did before. But I believe it's going to become like concrete and steel. It's the basis of a huge industry. Nobody builds anything without using a little concrete and steel and wood. And those have been around a long time. Okay? What happens is what's interesting now is not the materials that you build the things out of it, but the things you build. What's important is what we do with the silicon. It's not the silicon itself. And so it's going to be re remain a dominant substrate for computing. And the interesting things are basically the architecture of the systems that we build out of the silicon. And that's going to be a huge area. And that's going to be more interesting, I believe, than any of the new technologies that people have been talking about. So the problem we're facing now is that we have an established mature technology. We are energy limited. And we want to build a system that's way better than other people have. So the way we think about this is, right, you have some plot. This is the energy. And this is the utility, the performance of your system. And if you do a design, you get some point in the space. And if you're a mean faculty member like I am, you can talk to Elad. You have them do more designs. And then you have your students do more designs until you finally figure out there really does seem to be an edge of the feasibility region. And what you want to do is, depending on your various constraints, you want to be someplace at the efficient frontier. Okay. So the name of the game in the future is trying to figure out what the efficient frontier is or finally think of a way to really change that frontier. Does this make sense? So I tell all my students that, look, you're all very smart. But if you're attacking a problem that people have been thinking about for 20 years, I'm not very optimistic of you being successful. That's the difference between me and a theoretician. Theoreticians like to attack problems that people haven't solved for 20 years. Me, I want to avoid those. Right? Instead, what I say is, look, what you want to do is you want to think of a problem that, in a different way or a way people haven't thought of before, because that's the place that you can make major changes. And just relating that into the future, if we talk about the efficiency of a computer while it's running, we have this frontier, and I'll talk a little bit about it. But if we redefine the problem, as was suggested in the morning, about what the average energy cost is, by turning off that computer when it's not used and being able to wake it up so people don't notice it's off, we will save much more energy and lower the energy cost of that curve by a tremendous amount just by redefining the problem we're trying to solve. So if we're trying to optimize energy, you know, low power research is not a, 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 a new area. I contend that in all the 
two decades or more of low power research, uh, um, we've only decided one thing that is really useful for reducing power. You can stop wasting stuff. And you can waste two things. You can waste energy directly by toggling things that you don't ever look at, right? Or you can waste it indirectly by requiring something to complete before you start the next thing when the next thing didn't depend on that first thing. And the reason that wastes energy is because, as I forgot to point out on the previous slide, there is this boundary, and typically if you could deal with less performance than you did before, it will cost less energy to do. Okay? So you can waste either performance or energy directly, and that costs energy. So using some simple math, assuming scaling continues but dyes don't shrink in size, the average power per gate must decrease by 2x per generation because we have twice as many gates. If they shrink in size, that gives you about a factor of 1.4. So where's the other factor of 1.4 going to come about if we're power limited? Well, one way it might happen is the push for parallelism. So again, if you look at this curve, this is again the plot of all CMOS microprocessors or that I could get data on. This is in sort of energy per instruction versus peak performance. Normalized to technology, so I try to take technology out of it. So you can view that there's a sort of a curve, and don't bother me about those two processors. Those were the HP Focus chipset, which had an outside second level cache, or first level cache. And so their total power was way above what was spec'd on the chip, so I'm just ignoring them. Okay, now what's happened in all the mi modern microprocessors is you went from basically a point up here to decrease the performance of a per processor by maybe a factor of three is probably the optimal amount to change it. When you do that, the power, the energy per instruction goes down by a factor of 10. So for the pa same performance limit, you can do 10 times the performance you did before. Okay. Takes 30 times as many processors because each processor is running 10 times slower. So it's an area inefficient solution, but it allows you to increase performance by a factor of 10 by the amount that you've saved in energy per instruction. So that ends up moving one of the curves to the right by a factor of, uh, of about three. Okay? Does that make sense? Actually, by a factor of 10. Now, so one possible solution for the future, and a lot of people are going down this road, is to exploit parallelism to lower VDD so the gates become slower, but they become more energy efficient, and make that up by basically building bigger chips that have more copies of that unit. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so this will work, but it only works when you're on this part of the curve, because once this curve starts flattening out, it's not going to work very much. So what are you going to do when that runs out? The other thing you're going to do is you're going to start thinking about what problem are you trying to solve, and you really want to do this problem reformulation, which basically says think about the problem in a new way and be able to drive the curve that you thought you were on to some new curve. Realizing that the power of the processor, the, uh, the home computers, is not when it's active because it's only really used 2% of the time, but it's all the time, it's not really active, but sitting around pretending or being ready to be active. And if you do that, you'll be able to move the curve both down and to the right, and that's what we're really trying to do. The problem is, I'm going to skip that. The problem is, to do that, you usually have to optimize for a particular application set. Okay, and people know that you can build much more efficient ASICs than you could general purpose computing, and that's what really gave rise to the ASIC business. So you would think that, with this need for more efficiency, ASIC business would be booming, but in fact it's dying. And the reason it's dying is that the design cost for doing an ASIC is now upward of $20 million. So like custom design was in the early 80s when it was too expensive for most people to think about, okay, ASIC design came in and it basically enabled a whole new group of people to do design. We are now at the complexity that ASIC design is too complicated and we need something else to come in if we're going to allow people to really build specialized solutions. So I think there's a quandary of what the industry is going to do, and there's a whole bunch of possibilities here. One possibility is some brilliant researcher is going to build a very more efficient compute platform. And you know, this is not 
You know, Bill Daly is working on one at Stanford, but you know, every major semiconductor manufacturer is working on one. These all are the combinations of vector machines and multiprocessing. And you're going to see these come out in the next couple of years because we have to increase performance and we have to increase energy efficiency to do that. So this is going to happen. This is going to happen. The other thing that's happening is most people think about computing at the high end. right? They worry about what your PC is going to happen. But there's a tremendous growth, a much larger growth, about computing at the low end, where we're now putting computers in everything because they cost 50 cents, right? And they have tremendous performance. So I went to the Maker Faire, and at first I was, I was a little offended that the little blinky lights that they sold had a microcontroller behind every blinky light. And then I realized, exactly, why wouldn't they? You know, the blinky light's 50 cents, the microcontroller's 50 cents, it's a perfect thing. You can program the blinky lights to do whatever you want. It's, you know, so everything's going to have a computer in it. You can't buy a card, it seems, today without having a chip, a battery, and a speaker in it, right? And I just was in Japan and it had actually fiber optics and LEDs too, because, you know, why not? So, so I think we shouldn't, shouldn't forget about computing's future may not be in the high end. It may be in the proliferation of all these very small devices for which CMOS it's really not the limitation, it's the application and cost limitations that come about. But if you are focused on the high end and you want to do better, the question is, can we basically enable people to do more application optimization of their, for, of their um, computing substrate for their particular goals? And I think having built a lot of chips, the thing that frustrates me the most is that it takes a lot of time. Chips are very complicated. But what we do is not really changing that much from generation to generation. What's hard is getting complicated things to work is complicated. So is there a way that we can automate some of the crank turning? And I'm just going to end with a brief introduction to a research program that we're starting up at Stanford called Rethinking Digital Design. And it looks like this. We have an application we want to implement. So the two processes that we could go through is an ASIC design, which is very expensive, but we get basically a good optimized system. Another thing we could do is we could take a programmable platform that's currently available, configure it, and we get a configured system which may not be efficient enough for what we want to do. So why don't we use the standard software trick of adding, excuse me, a level of indirection. Instead of building a programmable chip, why don't we create a virtual programmable chip? So we've designed and built the entire infrastructure for a programmable chip, but it's virtual, which means you actually can change the resources you care about. You can change the amount of memory you have. You can change the number of processors you have. You can even change some of the hardware support. Once you map your application onto that, you go through a process that generates the optimized chip. And you end up with a semi-custom system, just like we used to do semi-custom chips, okay, but we've moved the abstraction to a higher level. Okay, another way to put it is ASIC designs have really good efficiencies, but really cruddy design costs. Programmable things have better design costs, but not so good efficiency. Why don't we put something right there? Okay, and that's what we're working to do. Um, we've built a system that is a multiprocessor generator. So it basically consists of a system that has this configurable processor with memories. And so you could take a particular application. You can customize the processors. We happen to be using Tensilica to make that easy. And then you have a configurable memory system. So we can generate from this template lots of different memory systems and processor configurations. <laughs> And the first experiment that we did is we said, OK, using this generic multiprocessor generator, what happens if we try to do H.264? We chose H.264 because there are both software implementations of it and ASIC implementations of it. OK, so initially, when you just mapped it to the Tensilica chip, it was about 400 to 600 times slower than real time than what we needed. So students worked um, and tried to basically speed up the implementation by both using what you might call generic data parallel optimizations. Those are these boxes. And from that, you got you know, about an order of magnitude improvement in performance. Energy per frame improved by a little less than a factor of 10. But to really get improvements, we had to do very customized changes to the implementation for the particular application that we were running. And when we did that, we got within a factor of three overall to what the ASIC got. 
So by working at this higher level, we didn't get as, as good as an ASIC did, but we got pretty close. And in the um, fractional motion estimator, we've got a new design that puts us even closer. Okay, so there's a bunch of interesting work that we're trying to do in terms of building this chip generator. There's a question about really evaluating what the potential benefits are. So we have one example that looks promising. We need a couple others. We need to worry about if we have this generator, how do we do the optimization? A lot of the tuning is going to have to be automatic. So we have a really interesting methodology for doing joint circuit architecture tuning. We have to worry about validation because I don't believe in correct by construction. So anything I generate, I have to create the validation test suite for. So we've got some people looking at how to do the validation for this. And finally, you know, it's a really interesting question just to say, how do you write a generator? I mean, I know how to tell students how to write Verilog for hardware design, but I think writing Verilog is the wrong thing. I think what we want to do is basically write something that will generate solutions that has longer, that has long, longer lifetime than just a single design. So in conclusion, I think the technology engine that's driving IT is slowing down. Um, and power efficiency is a real problem. I think we will use parallelism in all its forms to help us out, but that's not going to go as far as we need. Ultimately, I believe we're going to have to look at optim application optimization. And you know, the easiest thing to do is to have some programmability in the system and use software to basically take advantage of that to leverage the power states in the overall application. But in those things that actually really do need to compute, and there are some, when you're doing ultrasound of, in a portable handset, there's a lot of flops that have to happen. You're going to have to be able to optimize that design. And I think in order to do this efficiently, we're going to have to rethink how we do design. And I think we're going to have to build things that have basically um, longer lifetimes than um, just a single design. And so I think we should focus on building chip generators and not chips. Thank you all. So I was following your train of thought up the, am I on here? Yeah. Me? So so I was following your train of thought right up to the last statement here. You were saying that build generators, but then you showed generators were 10x less power efficient than doing an ASIC, which uh, I'm presuming that was even less power efficient than doing something fully customized. Um, so how do you get to the conclusion that power efficiency is going to draw you to kind of these higher levels of abstraction? It, it seems to go in the wrong direction to me. So I, I think the answer is, well, there's two twofold. First of all, at the time that semi-custom came out, people said, oh, semi-custom is never going to be good because it you know, loses some efficiency over custom design. And it does. The point is it enables a whole new group of people to build solutions that couldn't build solutions before. And because those solutions are optimized for their application rather than using a generic solution, they're actually much more efficient than they would have been on a set of microprocessors or generic DSPs. Right? So the comparison isn't what you could have built, what you couldn't have built because you couldn't enforce the NRE cost. The question is, what's the best solution available to you? And I think we need to go to application optimization. I believe with time, the difference between this and an ASIC is going to shrink. I believe it's about 3x now. And 3x is pretty darn good, given that ASICs are about 600, 500, 600 times better than a more generic CPU. So the power efficiency is a fixed cost of doing Right. Well, well, right. There's a fixed cost you're willing to, to pay for it, and then it's what's the most efficient thing you could do from that. Right. Hi, Mark. Um, Hi. This is work. Um, uh, along the same lines, but, uh, but, but in a different direction, okay. why don't you go one step further instead of using a fixed microprocessor-like architecture, go down all the way to a hardware accelerator, which today people can generate automatically uh, from C code, and then you get another 2x efficiency versus software running on a, on a microprocessor, even in Tensilica. OK, so I think what I said probably was, a li uh, yeah. I, I apologize for not making this clear. When I talk about building chip generators, I don't talk about a chip generator being a microprocessor chip generator. What I happen to have built for other reasons, you know, because the previous couple of years I had been working on this very flexible microprocessor, I had the infrastructure to build a microprocessor chip generator. So you use the hammer you have because building a generator is like building an ASIC, it costs you $20 million, and right. So 
I completely agree that when you are thinking about a domain, you want to build the generator for that domain, and that will have this kind of functional generators. Like there's some really interesting work at CMU called Spiral that takes signal processing code in an abstract way and build, generates hardware for it. There's lots of um, uh, companies that take stylized C code and creates an accelerator. Sinfora is a good example. All of those could be blocks in the generator that you put your block of code in. The thing is, from a systems architecture perspective, that has to be somewhat constrained, because otherwise I don't think I could build the validation wrapper that I need to deliver with the part. Okay, but you could definitely have those blocks. So, so maybe I missed an assumption here, but uh, so what about mass costs here? I mean, let's say the tools are free, uh, Joe can write a chip, now what? Yeah, so uh, it's a common misconception, and I'm, people who know fab better than me can you know, correct me, but it, it's um, generally the case that manufacturing NRE costs are less than 10% of the total design cost of a, sort of a custom chip design. So there's lots of really interesting things you can do in that area, right? I have lots of ideas, but you know, my mommy told me well, right? Hit the bigger nail first. So I'm gonna do the nine tenths versus one tenth problem. It's called, I can get it down to a million dollar for a mass set. I'm, you know, it's not gonna be the most advanced technology. I'd be a happy camper. Yeah, well, let me just respond to that then. So, so it's true what you said. I, I accept what, what you said is true, that the, it's only 10% 10, 10 of the NRE is in the mass cost today, but it's a little bit like your story about ASICs. So when ASICs started out, they were a good and expensive way for people to do designs, but then they got to be too expensive. As technology scales, if you want to continue to do uh, these, these generators in, let's say, even, uh, let's say, 45 nanometer, mm -hmm. then, yeah, maybe it'll still remain true that mass, mass sets will be a few million dollars or a million dollars. But as, you know, if, just like in the ASICs, technology mm -hmm. advanced, everybody got more greedy, they wanted bigger mm -hmm. ASICs, they wanted fancier ASICs, mm -hmm. the same thing's going to happen to you on your NRE for your, right. uh, for your fab. And, and, and the truth is, if I could figure out a way to decrease the design NRE cost down, by about an order of magnitude or more, then the next thing I do is figure out ways that we could build a manufacturing process to basically decrease that cost. And my personal opinion, you know, not that you asked me, but I've got, I've got the you know, soapbox here, is that one of the only places that I think 3D integration makes sense is to decrease manufacturing cost. It, it, manufacturing NRA, the cost per system will be higher but the designer NREs can be much less if you 3D stack things. I think most of the times that people talk about 3D stacking for putting memory closer and all this other stuff is basically completely bogus. So uh, you know, it's non-compelling from an economic so perspective. So you do that so you can reuse masks. Exactly. You do that to reuse masks or sub-designs and stuff like that. Right, it's, right, but that's a whole different, you want to do that, we can talk about it in, in the break. No. I noticed a little bit of impatience with uh, uh, new device concepts. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, very, it's very difficult to uh, break into the ecosystem. There's a whole ecosystem for doing things the way they're done now. Uh -huh. And uh, so it, it means that uh, if you do have something new, it has to have, a, it has to be like fantastic and overcome a tremendous <laughs> barrier. Exactly. And, but I think uh, that has of course happened in the past many times. And just to suggest one possibility for these uh, tunneling transistors is we've been emphasizing how uh, big an influence it would have on digital technology, but uh, these are essentially much more sensitive transistors and could also have a lot of uh, analog applications where there might be some initial, uh, it might be easier to overcome the barriers to penetration initially. So, so I think you just have to be a little patient. No, okay, so it's not a question about patience. Right, I, I think I'm a patient guy. I've had students who have been with me for a very long time. Um, but uh, the, the, the issue is that it has to have a, a reasonable story. You know, I've been, I'm older than I look, I guess. I've been around for a long time. I was around for the gallium arsenide as being the next technology for a long time when silicon funding went down because silicon was kind of done. Um, so the thing is, I'm not against tunnel transistors. If tunnel transistors actually come out and they look kind of like FET transistors and I, you know, I don't have to change my infrastructure, that's great. I, I think virtual devices are virtually capable. And real <laughs> devices are stuck with real variability. Okay. And so if the variability in the turn-on voltages for the tunnel devices is well controlled, you know, I think it's very interesting. If that turns out to have 100 millivolts of control and where the tunneling turns on, which is not unreasonable given the tolerances and stuff, 
their advantage is not going to be as strong as you might guess. So it's not that I, I, I'm happy to talk to anybody about your technology, right? And I promise to give you reasonable feedback. It's just that I'm a skeptic because I know all the things that people aren't doing in CMOS because it costs too much or it's too much variability and everything else. I mean, there aren't very many atoms in lots of places when you're building things that small, and you have to worry about that. That problem doesn't get away, however you build stuff. So I think that is a, a good preparation for the panel discussion for tomorrow, and uh, we'll be able to follow up on that. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, Mark again.